wanted to speak directly with you because of this, you know, prevalence in baseball. Obviously, I'm not a baseball expert, so I want to have somebody who can speak to it, who's been there, understands the intricacies of it. And then I, I've done a bit of work uh, as of late with some basketball. Um, and I think it's similar, like, because there's not this requirement to run 100 meters or 60 meters or whatever. Um, so it's short accelerations. You know, there's some sitting on a bench once in a while. And maybe the culture of the sports isn't very focused on working on sprinting. or So I think there's some parallels there. Um, so we can yep. talk a bit about both of those sports okay. and, and what you think is going to help remedy this uh, if, if it's possible. Um, okay. But first, what I want you to do is just give me some background. I, obviously, I know who you are. I know what your expertise yeah. is, what your experience is. But for the people listening, I want you to give some background on what you've been through and, and, and the, the kind of areas you've worked in. Well, thanks for having me on. I think it's gonna be, this will be fun. Of course, you, know, you and I have spent a little time together. And every time we get together, we have some great conversations and a bunch of laughs too, which is probably important. As it's the most important part. <laughs> yeah, no, no question about it. No question about it. Well, let's see. Uh, my humble beginnings began, began back in 1981, where I ended up being the, the strength coach for my alma mater's football team at California State University, Chico, about 100 miles north of Sacramento Division II school up there. And uh, 1984, got my first, uh, I guess you could say, big-time gig, but full-time job in that arena as I was uh, uh, associate director of a, a hospital-based sports medicine center up in Chico through the hospital. Um, in 1984, I got hired on as UCLA's first ever strength and conditioning assistant. The wow. following year, I was their first ever full-time strength and conditioning assistant. Of course, that, that wasn't unusual. Now, I think, I think the thing that, that, to note there is that a school like UCLA, having their first paid assistant, but every school in the country was that way. Penn State, Texas, Florida State, University of Washington, Michigan, they're all the same, right? Um, this was a long time ago. The, 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 the profession was getting ready to bud a little bit. Mm -hmm. so I spent 10 years there. In 1993, I headed off to the Oakland A's, became their first ever director of strength and conditioning. And of course, enjoyed uh, what is probably one of the most enjoyable and rewarding times, the Moneyball era, mm -hmm. uh, which I was a part of. And always love to chat about that because it was just so, it was magical, really. At, at some point, you'd have to call it that because it was a brand new thing. It's hard these days, Derek, to find something that's brand new anymore, right? And that's yep. when the metrics started coming out and so on. I uh, left a little bit, about four years with Jason Giambi when he took off to the Yankees. It enabled me to kind of run my own business, work with him, write a book. wrote a book with Joni Antonio on nutrition and training for baseball. And, um, and then I wanted to get back in it again. So I went back to UC Santa Barbara in 2005, became their director of strength and conditioning and, um, for four years. And then um, Billy Bean called me back. So I went back to the A's for my second tour of duty, as you say. Mm -hmm. So I was really lucky to have the best job in baseball twice, um, no question about it. Even today, that job I had then today is still better than I think anything that's out there. Um, just the way they run things and, sure. uh, and what it's done. Uh, from there in 2011, I became uh, NC State's first director of assistant athletic director, director of strength and conditioning over everything, including football. My primary sport was men's basketball. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was there until just last year at this time. So now, right now, I'm the director of sports science for Powerlift. Jeff Connor uh, brought me in and created a position that no other equipment company has. It has allowed me to kind of spread out and, and get into things that I like to do. We partnered with several companies outside of equipment, bringing in more science, more coaches. And so we started uh, you know, this industry's first uh, sports science educational board with, with some really big time scientists, people that you and I have talked to and respect and studied under and about and around and um and we're just kind of uh, moving in several directions i do a little consulting and uh do some publishing for simply faster which you know about and mm -hmm. gives me some time to do extra things so um that's the short version i know i've coached for about 35 something years but really i've only had a few jobs so i've been lucky that way that's good and um i know on the equipment side a lot of the time when i you know talk with equipment companies they are kind of missing that person to bridge the gap on the, you know, the, the science and execution of things. So it's nice to see you have that position now. Well, Jeff has just got great vision for somebody who's been doing it for so long. You know, I mean, he, he saw the same things I saw and really, and I think I know you could, you can align with this, that think about how many companies don't have coaches selling products to coaches. I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was these tracking companies, right? I, 
And I, and I say, you know, what better conduit is to have a strength and conditioning coach sell products to strength and conditioning coaches. We speak each other's languages, especially in the tracking industry where, you know, we, we see sports scientists coming on and, and running the tracking and the, the technology. But at most universities, the strength coach does that. You know, so being, there is no magical power of being a sports scientist. It, 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 it's almost a subtitle, in my opinion. Uh, everything we do, Derek, is based on the science. So, you know, whether we're sports scientists or we work in the science of sport or whatever. Um, but, yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you know, to be able to, to get with that. And so, you know, right now, we, you know, coming up at the NSCA, we're going to have a few posters on the posterior chain developer that we have. The power lift and Paul Comfort and Tim Suckamel are doing some research there. They're both on our board. So we're going to start, you know, doing more science on our products, you know, so that it, you know, it's easy for me to say, hey, buy our equipment, right? You know, well, of course you want us to buy it because you make it. What I want to do is say, yeah, we make it, but we want, we want you to buy it because the science says it's the right piece to have. And so uh, that, I think we're going to, we're going to be creating a lot of buzz around people who really want to dig deeper into why we do what we do. It's going to be good. That's great. Now, if we go back to your UCLA days, because yeah. I think that was kind of an interesting period too. Um, what kind of sports did you work with? What kind of people did you interact with during that period? I think uh, that's pretty interesting. Well, you know, the division of work is really simple. The head strength coach gets football for sure. If it's a basketball school, he gets basketball. Then you either split the rest of the sports where you're the head strength coach for half of them and the assistant on the other or you do the majority of them. And that's kind of how it worked for me at UCLA. You know, I, I was really lucky to be around a program that, that was premier in that league. But the, the head coach, Terry Donnie, who just, I mean, the only way I can say it is he, he took me un, under his wing, which is difficult to do when, uh, you know, you're 36 years old, <laughs> you know, try, getting under somebody's wing. But he did. And he put me on the sideline right out front and made me a part of the program. And um, so, you know, I assisted on men's basketball, which the head coach at the time had. And then, you know, I mean, I, I pretty much had everything else. You know, I had men's women's track. I had men's women's rowing crew. I had men's women's volleyball. Um, I don't think there was anything I didn't have, you know, or assisted with really because the head strength coach was, you know, definitely had his plate full with both men's and, you know, both, with men's basketball and football. So I, I really, I'll tell you what's really interesting about that is my, my age job was kind of punctuated by that because the, the president at the time, Sandy Alderson, said, you know, obviously, you know, you played baseball up through college, which I did, and, you know, had a successful Division II career. He said, you know, of course, hiring you with that background is an obvious notion. He said, but, and here's a guy who just, you know, trusts who he hires and believes in, you know, his people around him. He said, but I think what you really bring to our table is that you've worked with so many other sports. That's important to me. And I, I thought about that. And, you know, I, I can tell you that whatever sport I work with, I've seen that body and how it reacts to other things. So in baseball, it was perfect. I saw the shoulder in tennis. I saw the shoulder in swimming. I saw the shoulder in uh, volleyball, water polo, yeah. volleyball. I mean, I seen it all. So there was no getting around the fact how I was going to take clear shoulders, you know, in terms of, you know, sprinting and sprinting. I mean, I had, I had, uh, I can't remember if I had both track teams I know I had one for sure but I assisted in both of them and of course during that time you know I had Jackie Joyner I had Kevin Young I had Mike Powell I had yeah so you had uh, was uh, uh Kurt, Bobby Kersey and John Smith around Bobby Kersey was the head yeah. woman's sprint coach he was he was the head woman's track coach yeah. handled the sprints and at the time he had his posse too so he also had Alice Brown and Jackie and Gail and Flojo and Jeanette Bolden Kenny Harrison wow. and then uh John Smith was the men's sprint coach yeah so if I was going to see speed anywhere, I was going to see it there. And still to this day, most of the stuff I do with running is centered around me just walking out, eating lunch, not but, you know, 20 yards from the first turn of the Duck Drake Stadium track. I mean, seeing that all day long, including the Europeans who came over in the wintertime. So I got to see gold medalists and world record holders essentially all year long. So, um, yeah, so anyway – that was the piece that I was able to be exposed to so many sports. And so I got to see the personality and the makeup of each kid in that sport. And typically, you know, when we left, I, you know, we had already won 25 national championships in 10 years across the board. So I was, I was able to see not only the athletes that were great in this country collegiately, but a lot of those kids became international stars too. 
And so I was able to see, you know, what kind of kid is that? You know, what can I make of that? So, I mean, the contribution during that time was uh, that, that UCLA gave to me. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't sign up for a course like that. Yeah. Were you there when uh, Troy Aikman was there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Troy yeah. Aikman, Reggie Miller. Yeah, that's great. So you go from this multi-sport um, environment where you have a lot of control over what you're doing, and, and, and then you go into baseball. What was that like? What was that transition like? You know, I just finished writing an article. It'll be out simply faster. My, uh, I get this question all the time. You know, what do you prefer? What do you like best? You know, the pros or college? For me, the answer to that question is I don't, I don't look at it that way. I think the better question to me is, you know, what's the difference? Uh, I didn't like, you know, I like to coach. It just so happens that during that time, that was the perfect time to go. You know, I wasn't going to uh, elevate any, any further at UCLA. Um, you know, we'd won national championships. You know, that was a time when, when strength coaches really weren't getting rings and watches and bonuses. I know they weren't definitely getting bonuses. I can tell you that. <laughs> But and I I got some watches and rings, but you know that only goes so far. So I thought this would be a great opportunity. Um, when I got the call and asked and was asked to interview for that job, um, so I was lucky because I'd played baseball, so I understood the environment already. Now I didn't understand the the, the big league, the major league environment. Not unlike a lot of guys who start in the minor leagues, right? Mm -hmm. But but I knew uh, I knew the game, and so that was a big help. You know, it's like going to a Spanish speaking country. And even though you've never been before, if you speak Spanish, you've already got it licked. Right. So uh, I think that, you know, there was some respect there already. And, and the fact that I came from a school like UCLA that was visible all day, every day, everywhere. That was another thing that hit those players. Um, OK, so you kind of want to say it was seamless because Barry Weinberg, who was our athletic trainer at the time, he really, you know, I mean, I owe him the majority of my success if any I had in that game from him because he really just kind of the way I vision is he walked ahead of me with a machete and cut down all the vines that were going to stop me from being good right wow. and, and uh I mean you know and every every athletic trainer I had since then and there was only a few I mean we're like brothers you know I mean we're finishing our sentences and for for, our, for each other and that, that's how tight we were but that was also how things were you know we didn't have this monolith of executives you know and I was even talking to Paul DePodesta who the guy that was uh, portrayed in the Moneyball movie is the person that came in and started this analytic the other day so he's with the Cleveland Browns now and uh, he said he goes you know when I was talking to him about you know people don't got they don't have the sports scientist thing the sports performance team quite down yet here you know I mean there's they think about streamlining and that's really what this thing does it streamlines the information to the manager the GM whoever it is I think here in the country, we've just created more layers. It, it makes it worse. And like Paul said, you got to remember it was me, you, Billy, Sandy, and the trainer, and Art Howe. You know, that, that, that was our sports performance. And we were in the same room time. We talked every single day. I mean, there was no meetings. There, there were no meetings because you know, we talked so much uh, that, that it, was, it was so fluid. So really, for me, I was lucky because I came from UCLA. I'd already played the game since I was nine. and uh, played college ball, which is not, you know, certainly the pinnacle of any success, Division II athletics, but I knew about the game, so that was helpful. You know, there's a difference between people letting you do your job and people helping you do your job, and these guys were not going to let me fail because they, that's how they all thought, like nobody's going to fail here. We're going to help everybody, and so there was no way I could make any mistakes. You know, they were going to help me. They were going to be honest with me, whatever they were going to do, so, you know, I, I guess, I guess if you had your druthers and if you were good and you knew what you were doing, it's terrific that somebody just kind of leaves you alone and lets you do your job. The best scenario is if they help you do your job. That's what these guys did. Now, I'm not going to be cynical, but uh, from what I'm hearing from a lot of different professional organizations and teams, that's a rare experience that you had. Yeah. Hey, listen, I, I tell people before, like, you know, when we start having our meetings, so Fernando Montez, myself, and Steve Rogers, who's now with um, – He's been running Boris's uh, physical training piece, uh, mm -hmm. the, the agent. You know, we started having our meetings, which is the, the organization we started is still in effect, Professional Baseball Strength Conditioning Coaches Society, which at the time started out, our first meeting was in a, a Disneyland hotel room. There was seven of us or eight of us, a, a, a cooler, a beer, and a whiteboard. And so we didn't, that was our first meeting. Now there's, you know, I think there's over 150 people in that meeting. Um, all minor league strength coaches, head strength coaches, assistants is really terrific. 
but I would tell people, you know, I mean, the first thing you need to get in there and talk about how bad the relationship is with the head coach, how horrible your relationship is with your trainer. I'm like, my trainer sucks. I can't help. Oh, God, it's horrible. Well, I kind of just stepped back and thought, really? <laughs> so it, you know, I, I really been between a place, you know, a, 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 hard, a hard spot in the rock there because if I told everybody the kind of deal I had, you think I was bragging or lying. So I, mean, I didn't, really couldn't tell everybody how great I had it. And, and uh, in all, all honesty, it, it, it could have been the best, the value of my job, the actionable items that were taken up on my behalf, because everybody in the room said, we're doing that, you know, in terms of for us to be great, we're doing that. Uh, now, now, I'm not saying my, my, my requests were always honored, but I wasn't, I never felt it was personal. It was always how do we win a world championship? So what's the difference? What's the difference now then? What do you think's going on? Is it just the, is it the quality uh, of the people? Is it the way things are structured? Yep. Is, no, I mean, yep. I mean, you, you, you tell me, you pick one thing and you're going to, and I can say, yep, it's that. And then another thing, yep, it's that. Well, first of all, the structure is horrible. You know, I mean, if you look collegiately, we're supervised by people who have no concept, let alone idea of what we do. How's that possible? They're doing our performance review and then putting it in a file that's, that's on file. I mean, that, how's that possible? I mean, that, that's, you know, and of course, I've, you know, you and I have talked about this. You've seen what I put. People listening to this will probably see the same thing. We need somebody in a senior associate role, an assistant general manager's role, just to supervise not just the strength and conditioning, but the sports performance group. And it needs to be a coach. Sorry, athletic trainers. Sorry, sports nutritionists. Sorry, sports scientists you're not in deep enough to where we are to understand that we're better at, at organizing that group and knowing what's happened. You know, we're more involved with performance than those other groups. You say what you want, but now athletic trainers say, well, I, I, don't, I don't think I agree with you, you know, and I say, okay, you take somebody who has a sprained ankle. When you rehab the ankle, does he go play in a game? No. Does he go into practice? No. He goes to me. And then I do my thing and release them. So there's the end of that. Uh, sports nutrition, sports health. So we understand that. But so that's number one. The concept there is we need a better, we need a better understanding of the performance group is. Everybody looks over it at New Zealand, and you know what I'm talking about. We're looking at New Zealand. We're looking at Australia. They, we're not that. We're not even close to that. Because the di even if you get that same setup, the dynamic of those personalities in that group and what that means there is different than what we see it here. Right? So it's, it's not – it's not unlikely that I go to a coach at the college level and say, you know, I need another week with this hamstring or this flexor or this pec or whatever it is, right? <laughs> that's, that's part of the issue when you bring in yeah. somebody from Australia and New Zealand and then you drop them in the North American experience and they're like, oh, my goodness, like, I can't yeah. function. Yeah, well, and so to be fair to them, I think oftentimes they're, they're underqualified for the spots, but also oftentimes the expectations – of them by the people who hire them are unrealistic. Like they, they think, oh, sports scientists, oh, we got it made now. Like, well, no, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, and so they, a lot of times that failure is not because of them, it's because of the expectations. They say, well, you didn't meet our expectations. Well, what are you gonna tell the guy? You can't tell them in words that they understand that the, this is not the case. So I think it's, it's kind of twofold there. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm certainly, and I've heard more than one person as you know, from, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and England saying, ah, you know, I'm looking for some work over in America. I'd like to come over there. And I, I say, you know, I, mean, I think the grass can be greener a lot sometimes. I mean, the wage probably be better here, but how much money is it going to take for you to tolerate some of the crap that you're going to have to put up with? I mean, that's, that's one thing. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's part of it. And the other part is, you know, just the, the place that that position holds in sport right now, you know, is it, is it really the position that we want it to be? You know, I mean, we have nine different titles for the same position. That, that's a little weird. Um, and like I said, you know, I mean, it's not unlikely at all. In fact, in fact, it's highly likely that any coach on staff from tennis to football can go in and say to me, I don't want my guys to squat. And they're not going to squat. I mean, you can say all you want, like, well, that's my program, and, you know, and you can write all the responses and like all my posts and follow me, and that, that doesn't mean crap, because in the end, you're probably going to get fired. We'll just find somebody who does. We'll just find somebody else who will do that, right? 
Well, so that, yeah. that, that dynamic, Derek, now comes from who's signing off on that, right? Like, I think you've seen that thing on Twitter right now with, uh, you know, our, our head football coach, I think it was a football thing, football coach is now getting more control over training staffs, right? Well, the answer is yes, <laughs> yes. So, and they say, well, we need to do this and this. No, 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 we don't need to do anything. What we need to do is look at the athletic director. Somebody signs that and says, okay, not the football coach. And it's not the athletic trainer. It's not the doctor. It's not, it's the athletic director. Somebody, those guys sign that thing at the very end. And so that's, that's where we got to start looking. Now, if we had somebody there who understood what we can do, really what they're doing is they're, they're creating borders for liability for the department, the institution, the team, the AD, the head coach. Like, coach, we, we have this here. I'm telling you we're not doing that. You. That has nothing to do with us, you know, protects you at university. And, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where we've seen several tragic instances, mostly in football, where they link it to the strength conditioning coach, right? And frankly, I'm not so sure those coaches didn't know what they were doing was not a good idea. But then you're weighing money's, money's good in football now. And what do I tell this coach? No, who do I go to? Who, who do I go tell? Like, I don't feel good about doing this. Because in many schools, football strength coach reports to the football coach. <laughs> so who's he going to tell? Right? So uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not good, you know. And, and Bob Bowlesby from the Big 12 a year ago at the media, fall media, saying, you know, we've got to look into how these positions, over, the oversight and the hiring, you know, and how this goes. So we can get us to a spot where we can – and in my case, look, you know – Sure, there's been some tragic incidents. Has it been a rash? I think if one person, you know, dies doing this, that's a rash to me. You're not going to be able to tell parents or relatives, oh, it's only one person, right? But think about, think about how many times we're just not allowing these kids to be better performers. I mean, think about the performance aspect of the kids could be jumping higher and running faster if we had the right situation in there. Because somebody like you and I would be evaluating that spot, setting up standards, operations procedures, have a management handbook, an operational handbook. Here's how we do it, you know. So, um, and like this hamstring with baseball, and you know, it's almost like every year we have a, uh, a roulette wheel. You spin it, and it goes click, 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 click. Soccer hamstrings. All right, for hamstrings this year, you know. This year, baseball's popping up. You know, and I know you understand this, but I just want everybody else out there to know. We don't know what's happening there. We know there's problems. It just seems to be like there's more hamstrings than ever before or at this one time or whatever it is. But I can also tell you, you know, I mean, there's other things that work here. You know, like, again, I'm not sure that the coaches in baseball don't know how to address the problem. They may, but just may not have the ability to. And for whatever reason, you know, I mean, that's that could be the way it happens. So, um, but I mean, you know, it's still a problem, but again, there again, that whole dynamic of the performance model where you're at, it, it, there shouldn't program your program. It's not democratic. You know, it's, this is what we do. It's not, it's not diplomatic. Like we're not, we're not going to, you know, cooperate on a program. Like we'll do a little bit of yours. No, <laughs> there's no diplomacy in injury or health. So, you know, there's lots of things that work. Yeah. Yeah. So if we really dive deep into this hamstring issue in baseball, um, and that's that's one of the reasons we're talking right now is is that yes, yep. uh, if you look in uh, in the news and the media, you'll see that you know so and so is missing two three weeks, and um, and it's really interesting because now it's being reported as hamstring tightness even, and I didn't know tightness was an injury. So yeah, you know, there's obvious risk factors, and yes. but guys guys are missing games. Um, and that and missing weeks and in I don't know a couple of weeks you're missing quite a few games and so there's money being left on the table so based on your knowledge of what happens and and the time constraints like I guess there's two issues one is what happens in the off season and then what happens in the in season but I know there's significant time constraints in season to address these issues yeah so I mean you know I I I should have a notepad here because my thoughts would be banging all over the place but I, I can tell you first of all that you know, the off season's an issue, you know, in baseball, rarely do you have a good solid group of your, your major league roster, let alone your 40 man roster, you know, locally where you can train them every day, you know, guys take off, they go live in their place, mostly places that are warm, 
because everywhere else is cold and they don't get, you know, their summer is spent playing ball. So, you know, you have, you know, this, this, uh, you know, this onset of, and glut really of personal trainers and training facilities. I dealt with a little bit, you know, back in the day, but it wasn't as, as prevalent as it is now. You know, so how do you, how do you fix that? You know, I mean, I don't know that you ever fix it. It's, you know, again, these guys are adults, right? And so this is one of the things I talked about. You know, what's the, one of the major differences, one of the two major differences I see is one is you work with a group of adults and one you work with kids, right? And those adults have families and daughters and sisters and sons and wives and ex-wives and girlfriends and boyfriends. I don't know. Right? And so those, those are different dynamics that you have to deal with. I don't know how that, you know, if you're asking me, well, how does that affect weight training? Well, how about sleep? How about travel? I mean, you know, you get to a point where, you know, you, you come into a day and a, and a guy, you know, play, we play in a long game. And the guy comes at the end of the game and says, you know, I didn't get much sleep last night. My son's got, had the flu and I was up with him and my wife had my daughter and, you know, I can't lift today. Okay. You know, I mean, that, that, that doesn't, that's not the situation that comes up with your junior at the college level, right? Typically. Um, and, you know, anniversaries and birthdays and high school and college and junior high and daycare. And there's lots of dynamics there. But I think in terms of the personal training situation, you know, to me, I, I think the only way to, to fix that is to embrace it. Like, I want to know who your training guy is. I'm going to go find him. I'm going to tell him what I want to do. I want to see every copy. We did that. Didn't have, we did it when I was with the A's. Um, both times because there really wasn't a lot. So it was easy to have guys send me programs. And I'd say, you know, now I'd promote hiring a trainer. I can't see you. I promote you going to find somebody, but here's the program you'll give them, you know, and if that doesn't happen that way, I'm going to document it just like I would in college, just like you would in your, in, in your place and say, this is what I said. This is what I did. Date, time, blah, blah, blah. Here's our testing. Here's our assessments. Uh, so that's, that's number one. Um, number two, the restriction time is really, you know, we play every day. So that was one of the things I learned in baseball is how do you train somebody on the day of a game, knowing that the next day is a game and you had a game yesterday. So it's not just training on game day, which now is kind of an internet buzz thing. Like, Oh, train on the same day, you know? And, and I say, I say to them, like, well, be careful just saying that because somebody's going to, you know, who really wants to do the best for their team younger, you know, high school says, oh, well, it's trained. So they just throw in the next extra day from last year's off season. And, it, you know, it's not the same thing. So you kind of have to, you know, have that act. When you put on the fact that you're not sure what happened in the winter and not everybody works out hard, right? So now you got, you, you got, well, so what do I do? You know, it's only, you and I talked about this microdosing thing and running. It's the same thing in lifting. You know, you can't have a really solid in-season program if you have a solid off-season program. You can't have Lifting at high intensities, which I promote and think is the best thing in season, high intensity lifting, very, very low volume. If you didn't have anything behind you that got you able to do that, right? So now you're now you're kind of you're screwed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, th those are you know those are the dynamics that you have to deal with. Now I can I can speak to the tightness thing, and I know you understand this. That you know anytime somebody's making. Well, making any money, I guess, if I'm the owner and I'm paying the guy money, but we're talking about one, two, five, ten, fifty million dollars. If he's going like this, like I'm saying, what is that? <laughs> let's let's put that away. Let's let's stop doing that, right? Um, so I, I I personally am for that because you know it's it's the idea of not turning uh, a a pimple into a boil, right? You want to keep it a pimple. So, you know, in the, in the big leagues, at least in the teams I was with, guys got upset at other guys when they found out they were out for two weeks when they had something they could have taken care of a week before that. They, they you know, were kind of growing up to think that, oh, you're going to be a tough guy. You're playing with your hamstring sore, your shoulder sore. They think it's selfish because if it's selfish, that means, you know, that you, you had a chance to hurt yourself. And when you do hurt yourself, who else? That doesn't help anybody. Now you can't play. So, um, you know, I – People are very sensitive. The money makes you more sensitive than ever. The more money you make, the more sensitive management is. You know, God forbid, you know, somebody tells you, you know, I've been in the training room getting treatment. I told, you know, I told Derek that my hamstring was sore, you know, and then I went out and pulled it yesterday. So there, there's, there's something there. You got to be careful, especially because you're playing every day. Now, did you find you had an opportunity when somebody got hurt 
that now like, hey, I actually get to work with them. And there, there's, there's an opportunity to actually build this person up um, because they're not having to go to all the games and, and yeah. put their energy there. Well, you know, like when any, anybody is, you know, limited or modified, the, the work that you can do is, you know, it's just a matter of time, right? I mean, until something happens, it's hard for you to get around that. So it's almost like it's easier to work with somebody with a pulled hamstring, you know, with a torn lat, with a, uh, you know, a oblique strain because you're at ground zero. Um, it's, it's trying to keep them out there all the time. That's the problem because sooner or later that sort of compensatory actions they're going to have to provide their body with is going to break them down, especially my age group, you know, when you're, well, my age group, the age group at baseball, when you got adults, I think, I think kids are probably more apt just to, you know, they'll compensate around it and get better. That compensation will help them heal actually probably for the most part. But when you get older, you know, that's not going away, especially at the ultimate level. You know, it's not as if you get to cruise a little bit there against, you know, Verlander one day and the next day or something, it just doesn't happen that way. And what about the culture? Like in terms of what, like, uh, obviously there's going to be players who think, well, I don't have to lift weights. I don't need to, I've just thrown the ball or hit the ball. I don't really need to sprint. Have you encountered a, a lot of that over your history with baseball? I, I really didn't, you know, I mean, I really didn't. Yeah. I, I think I was good about meshing programs with mentalities. I mean, you can't, you know, so first of all, at, at any spot, you don't want to tell somebody to do something. They say, I don't want to do. And then something bad happens. That's risk that you don't want to take. Uh, Cause if that, you just don't want to take that risk. And so, uh, you know, I, I was good about adjusting around it, you know, so we, we need to get resistance in there. Resistance comes in all kinds of forms. Sometimes you can tell somebody to do deadlifts or dumbbell work and they say no. And then you end up doing some sort of, you know, tubing or cable work, which is the same thing. And they just, they don't mind doing it, but they just don't know it's the same thing. It's, it's not like you're just not really tricking them, but you're just, you just do what you do. Right. So I, I didn't encounter it. Now I also say that, you know, there was guys that had programs that, that were not very comprehensive that never got hurt. And of course, we know about that with the bell-shaped curve. We got the guys over here that train all the time or hurt all the time. We got the guys over here that don't train much and they never get hurt. But at our job, Eric, we, we affect all the people in that 66% area, right? We, we put them in the right spot. Those are the people we affect the most. Um, so I, di I didn't really find that very much. I, and and I, like I said, you know, last time I was in a big league locker room, Training athletes was 2011, so you know a lot could have changed in the last seven years. Um, but but the influence on why they lift is the thing we have to deal with. You know, I used to say that the hardest thing is not educating baseball players at that level about training; it's re-educating them. And by that I mean tearing down some crap that they learned somewhere else. That's the hard part: to tear that down and tell them to do something else. Um, you know, and unfortunately, injury is the only thing, time off is the only thing that changes their mind. I, I, you know, there was a lot of guys, and I won't tell you who they were, big stars back in the day that would, you know, when the A's came into town, then we owned the weight room. We crushed weights in there all day long. And sometimes, you know, it's a very friendly, it's a friendly environment to teams. You know, you're using the same weight rooms. The guys are coming in and coming to watch. We're using it at the same time. And they would laugh like, hey, you know, I'm not doing any of that stuff, Alejo. I don't do that. I get it. All right. <laughs> but years down the road, five, six, seven years later, when, when they were hurt or older, everyone to a man said, I should, because, you know, in, within the league, you're just around, they're your friends, you know, like I, I, I would try to help get their team strength coach by saying, dude, you need to get in there and get the work done. But every one of those guys would come up to me and said, man, I should have listened to you. I should have started years ago. I'm talking about big time stars, a couple of Hall of Famers um, that could have had longer careers um, and they would have taken it too. Uh, they would have played longer. But so in terms of, you know, the whole idea and, and then you, of course, you know, again, I think the re-education part's the thing. And now, unlike then, you know, there's Twitter, Instagram. I don't remember if Facebook was around back then, but now, so now you have all these things. So if I'm a player that's struggling in the big leagues or in the minor leagues at all, like, I just feel like I need something, right? Well, you can just get on and type it all up. And I'm, oh, yeah, okay. I want to do this. How come I'm not doing that? You know, so that's another problem. Yeah, were there any um, – what, what I'm trying to ask here is were there any precursors where you could see, like, well, um, because they didn't do this, uh, they were at a risk, higher risk for hamstring strain? Like, 
if you look at something like warm up, how guys warmed up, uh, maybe what they did the day before, um, you know, maybe something that happened on the field. Like I, I noticed that a lot of pitchers are getting hamstring strains too, and probably just from the act of pitching. Um, you know, what can you tell me about your experience there? Um, not really, you know, I mean, so my years in the big leagues were, you know, like I said, you know, we, they were really good because the trainer and I worked really well together. And so our injury rate was really, really low. I mean, mm-hmm. we spent a lot of time looking at lots of variables before there was Excel sheets to add all this stuff up. We, we weren't just looking at injury as the best predictor. We were looking at treatments. How many treatments does this guy have? That was a red flag. It seems like a lot of icing on the shoulder, a lot. So we started being, you know, how are you feeling today? How are you? You know, so we knew, we talked all the time about it. Um, and again, we were, you know, on the same page all the time. So we would bring things to each other's attention. I, I can't remember. What would be I, a typical game day warm up? Like, what would you have guys do? And well, you know, warm up is so baseball is really weird like that. So if you're a home team, you know, you're on the field warming up at four fifteen for a seven o'clock game. The problem is you're dead sick, so you go sit down for an hour. That should be quite the other way around, right? Let let the visiting team have you know the the lack of benefit of warming up right before the game. Let the home team, but it's just you know that's not the way it's been. Well, we would get out and go through the regular warm up. You know, we we do a um, you know a, a passive stretch, a static stretch, a dynamic stretch. You know, short sprints. I would short sprint every day, every day. Five, call them starts or five yard sprints. You know, in the warm up every day. We truly believe that you you know you have to have you got to finish your warm up at a hundred percent effort, a hundred percent speed in some way or a fashion. Some way, your body's got to feel that. And, and I'm convinced, I don't know what the programs are out there, and I'm not saying the guy who, you can't do this. The guy who pulled the hamstring, oh, his, his warm-up must be bad. You know, I don't know that. But I do know this. Baseball's really not, I, wanna, I don't want to say receptive, but commonly not embracing full-speed sprinting and full efforts during the season, you know. And that's, you know, think about it. Who gets hurt at 70% speed or 70% effort? Swinging a bat at 70%, throwing a ball at 80%, nobody. It's all full speed, full effort. Uh, and I, I, you've got to, that's why this microdosing, that's why I called you and I, you know, I put on the tweet, is, you mean just a comprehensive training program? That's what I call it, because if you're not doing that, what the hell are you doing, right? But we would, you know, sprint our infielders and outfielders, you know, once or twice a week. I don't think it takes much. Especially guys who are playing every day. Now, the other guys may be an extra day, you know, guys who weren't playing much. And I'm not talking about distances past 15 yards. Just five, tens, 15, start. Start with the left foot forward, you know, alternate feet. Um, sprint out of an on-base position, you know, for fielders left and right. Have them switch, to, you know, and just blow out of there. Just blow out five or seven yards. That's important. Plus, not to mention, short sprints are a great and underrated plyometric exercise. Mm-hmm. I think you get a, you get four solid push and steps, you know, stretch shortening cycle, bang, 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 bang. And uh, I think that's invaluable. So, uh, I, you know, I've never really – now, the one thing I did learn with baseball, because, you know, baseball is predominantly not a full-speed, full-effort sport. But b- because there is full-speed and full-effort at times, you've got to plan for that. You know, you can't say, well, we're going to plan for 90% of the game, which is not that. Well, then you're going to hurt people. But at the same time, you know, you you have to let people know that somehow we've got to we've got to make sure we get that in, no matter what it is. That's why I also think that very high intensity lifting, you know, 85% plus, spend you know every three every three or four weeks at 90% plus, heavy and hard, because the muscles need to feel what maximum contraction is too. And here's another question I would get asked on that is. Well, if I do a heavy set of eight, the last one is hard. I say, yeah, but you don't get seven steps to warm up when you're sprinting to the alley to pick up a double with a man on second down by one. You got to go now. And when you take off 85%, you're locked in now, right? You're locked in now, whatever that is. And so you teach not only the speed of contraction, but full contraction. I think that's important. So it's not unlikely that you could sprint, which is terrific, but you're pampering the legs a little bit. I mean, I think that's the that's kind of maybe a basketball thing too, right? Well, we're running all the time. I don't know if I want to work my legs out. Yeah. To which you, your response, my response is, that's exactly why you wouldn't want to do that, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think a lot of people think running is running and they don't delineate it by velocities. And, you yeah. know, it's like, oh, we ran. Yeah, okay. 
Um, did yeah. you now, uh, you mentioned that you guys, you know, I know what you do. I know what results yeah. you had, very few injuries. Did you get a chance to watch how the other teams, when they came yeah. to your park, warmed up? Yeah. And, uh, did they hit the weight room? You know, what, what were your general impressions about what other teams are doing? Well, this is a while ago. I don't, I don't know if I have a general impression, but I, I saw a lot of programs that, you know, frankly, I was surprised. You know, I mean, not lifting heavy enough or often enough. Not a lot of not a lot of sprinting going on, you know, a lot of striding and things like that. Good good fitness programs, I think, for pitchers. And you know, the I think the pitchers are the guys that you have the best opportunity to, you know, have a, a little more complete program because you know when they're gonna play. Yeah. And you know when they're not gonna play. So you can plan for that. Um, which is why, you know, again, arms are a different story. Uh, but for legs, I, I don't know how that's possible. Now I will say I think a contributor to that is pitchers, you know, typically pitchers get in the big leagues, you know, they haven't hit or ran for a long, long time. And they may have done it in high school, but when they start getting into college, you know, I mean, so they're not doing any, any real extensive movement, angular, change of direction, any of that at all. And so they, you know, they're probably not good runners, but when you have to run in and feel the bunt or run to first base and cover first, I think you need to be good at that. You need to understand what that is. And so those, those kind of, and just doing those repeatedly. I mean, if you watch, if you get on spring training and you watch guys take ground balls back and run over, they're all half speed. I've never seen anybody go full speed. Even in my own camp, you try to, you try to get them to go full speed. Fortunately, I would have them running otherwise. Now, so I think if you're having them running otherwise, that's okay. And you probably have that filled in, but uh, it's hard to, it's hard to get pitchers to do those things since that, you know, the designated hitter is kind of taken the athlete out of those, out of that position. You know, they don't. So I spend a lot of time rolling balls to them. I'm fielding it, getting to a deep squat, field it, kind of exaggeration, exaggerated position of fielding the ball. And I'd throw it all over the place and make them go get it. It wouldn't be just right, you know, the basic pickup left, right. It would be over here, over here, right here, over their head, yeah, catch it over their head, run back. And well, we're getting heart rates up in the 200 range like that at full speed. So now we're doing a lot of speed endurance work. And but I, you know, I I, I think again, we're, I don't know how much strength coaches at the baseball level are paying attention to track and field or other sports for that matter about how how do we how do we do this? You know, I think it's I think it's peculiar. You know, they say that you know, well, so it's if I'm a right-handed pitcher and my left leg gets hurt, like I'm on my left leg all the time, right? I'm bending over it all the time. And I think, well, yeah, p part of it is that do you realize that, you know, through some of the biomechanical work that Andrews has done with David Stodden and Glenn Fisig, that left hamstring decelerates the right arm. So you're also talking about arm health in that hamstring, not just, you know, driving or whatever it is you want to say. That's That's arm health. So, you know, I think I've said, you know, Doing, doing a 15 pound single leg dumbbell RDL is ridiculous. <laughs> you got to be handling weight, bro. <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, I, you know, I'll tell you what, when I wrote that article on shoulder health, I was educated and further reinforced how important the legs are because of the hips stabilizing the scapula. I had no idea how much influence there was there, but there's actual research on just that scapular stabilization through pelvic, blah, blah, blah. Like, wow. You guys have you're just putting it together just like that, so you know. So I'm gonna say a hamstring, like yeah, okay. Um, so like I said, I, I, it's hard to generalize. I think there's some great coaches in baseball, but when I look out and you know, again, I'm only getting a three or four day snapshot. Hell, that could have been that three or four days before that they busted their ass and these guys are on the on a on a download, right? But uh, I think you know the, the typical thing was happening when I was there. We're lightweights, higher reps, not much squatting, not too many bars on the back. Um, not too many bars pulled off the ground, which is an unbelievable scapular stabilizer. So, you know, I, I you know, like I said, I, our, our goal, your goal, I know was not to say, okay, what's going on with those programs with the hamstring. And, yeah. you know, it seems yeah. like hamstrings have been a, a pretty rabid topic for the last two years. Right. Yeah. And how do we do that? And I say, you know, I don't know if it's rabid or not. I mean, I, I think maybe it just, it got brought to light because it got brought to light. At the same time, I do know that just in basketball and some of these other sports, how much time are we sprinting? You know, like full yeah. on, blow out, full effort sprints, get some recovery. I mean, like you and I talked about, I, I was running three to five sprints. 
that's it. Let them walk back. Take your time. Take your breath. I don't want you to run again until you can go full speed. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you do that every day, that adds up and, and it's yep. better than zero. <laughs> so. No, geez. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, you can't. Yeah, I, I, I'm right. You're right. You're right. I think there's a way to do it and it can be done. I, I think it's not, you know, I think when people think about sprinting and running, they think about, well, I'm going to be tired and exhausted. But, you know, I think they also think, about 30 or 40 yards of sprinting i'm saying no i, I think you're saying the same thing you start with five yards yep. or six yards or whatever it takes for that guy to get two or three ballistic strides per leg full go started from different positions we would do you know i think you've done it too laying down standing up one knee two knees facing left facing right turning around so you can drop and run three or four of those you're good that i mean there's no reason why that shouldn't be part of your warm up you should be doing that every day right after your warm up yeah, it's about, I think it's from the research I've seen, it's about six strides to get you over 70% of max velocity. Six strides yeah. per leg or three three and three? Yeah, three and three. Six yeah. six strides total and you're up okay. over 70, right? So, yeah, you're going 15, you're getting close, you're pretty close to max velocity by 15 for most people, so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of guys I know, um, if, you're not, if you're not paying close attention to them, when you're looking at guys like Bolt and them, you're thinking, well, you know, you're not going to re reach full speed till 60 meters. And, and the answer is, no, 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 he reaches full speed at 60 meters we're slower we, we yeah. reach it a lot earlier you know which is yeah. again the kind of thing i was telling our base runners like look you're not going to outrun the ball and if you get a bad start you're not going to be able to fix it in 20 meters or 10 meters so learn how to start we just worked on starts start start that's how you steal the base that's how you or that's how you get hit and run before the other guy so now i try to explain to you if you're not a base stealer that's fine but if you can get there in time and something happens and you take that guy out, now instead of having two outs, nobody on, we got a runner on second, one out, because all they can get is the guy at first. Now we got a chance to score. These things add up. Do, do you find that people in baseball understand the dynamics of that? Of like, if somebody's faster and they can turn a single into a double and how much that counts in terms of, you know, points and, and winning games, did you find that people were focused in on that? To answer your question. I think so. I think so for okay. the most part. You know, I, I mean, let me say, let me say, I think so, and I'd like to think so. I, I will say that that as we get into the collegiate setting, I'm not so sure that collegiate strength coaches, and I also wrote this too, uh, that you need to know the the vernacular of the sport, which means if you know that, that means you know the sport, and if you know the sport, then they're going to trust you more. You know, but if you're a strength coach in baseball. Even if you never played, it doesn't matter if you played. I mean, it'd be help, helpful. I mean, I'd be crazy to say that it wasn't helpful that people knew I played baseball. And then I, I was also, I also caught in the bullpen for the A's for nine years and through batting practice every day in the first group. So, you know, did I think that helped me? Hell yeah. It helped me tremendously be trusted about what I gave them in a program. But if I was just a guy that was just a, you know, a lifter, a runner, and, you know, start explaining things in terms of just running and lifting, instead of, you know, we're going to run 30 yards today. Well, why 30 yards? Because that's 90 feet. You know, my program was designed around first, second, third base. It wasn't anything intermittent. Those were our numbers, right? You start talking in those terms, and guys start getting you like, okay, yeah, I'd like to have a double instead of a single. You know, like that sort of stuff. I think it's super important. Collegiately, you know, we get handed sports that we may have never been exposed to. You know, you got six sports, and you may not know anything about swimming. But I, I know one of the reasons why I've had any excess, have had any success at all at the collegiate level is I dove into those sports. I know how to speak the language of a swimmer, a thrower, a, anybody. And that helps me, that helps me also understand what those things mean, you know, swinging the back, taking a stroke, backstroke, front stroke, all these things. Um, I, I hope if anybody's listening to this and they feel like, oh, you know, I haven't played the game, but, you know, my guys lift, yeah, but your training program will be better when you understand what it's like that you don't run, just run to first and take a turn. You have a deceleration and an acceleration and what they call bubble the bag. You turn the bag so you can get the inside foot to hit. Well, in the at spring training, when we got on the bases, our conditioning was on the bases. You know, we ran double singles, triples, and homers, but those doubles weren't just home to second. They were home to second, first to third, second to home, secondary lead. You know, now granted, again, I played ball, so that, that was a little more helpful for me. But, um, you know, like with the pitchers, you know, 
the one thing pitchers were doing were they becoming poor fielders because they didn't take grounders. They didn't play anything else. So I included the ball as much as I could in our conditioning, throwing it 10, 15 yards or five yards, change of direction. I make them pick up the ball and turn to first, pick up the ball, turn to second, then bring it back to me. Those were baseball related thing. If you understand those positions, if you ever fielded a ball, you need to know those things. You need to get out there and <laughs> let me tell you something. You take somebody who's not played the game and go, go take batting practice for five minutes, you're going to get about a 200 BPM. No doubt about it. <laughs> not that easy. Yeah. So to, to, to kind of finish this up, because I know you got to get going, but baseball is such a specialized sport. There's such a specialized uh, specific skill set. If you're advising somebody who's working with baseball, um, you know, especially on this injury issue, obviously over specialization can be part of your success, but it can be part of your, your, your injuries and your failures. What, what would you advise people again, going back to the UCLA multi-sport experience, how, what would you advise a strength and conditioning coach in baseball to focus on? I think you just hit on something that, that just triggered it in my mind. Baseball is all volume. It's all volume. Every bit of it's volume, which means you should be anti-volume when you train. Right. So, I mean, you hit, throw, run, swing, field every single day, every single day. So injury, in my opinion, can't possibly be from a lack of fitness. It can't be from lack of repetition because you're always doing something low intensity that way. That's why I say because of that, you need to go high intensity. But, you know, the caveat is you have to have done something to get there. Doesn't mean you can't build that up. But what you can't do instead is. Start at sets of, you know, if you just start when your guys come in in, in spring training, start with sets of three, three or four sets of three at 50%. And next week it's 55 and next week it's 60. And you can start out with that low volume thing because volume is still volume. You don't want to take anything away from the swings and the runs and the fielding and all that. So that's the first part. The second part is you've got to get your players to feel full speed, full effort, whatever it is, you know, whether it's, you know, lifting, which you should be able to get with the heaviest weight possible. Granted, the season's long, probably have to get away from straight percentages and just say, what can you give me for two? What can you give me for one? Because especially for us, I really wanted the lifting to be um, fruitful. And I didn't want to lift before a game because I didn't think we we're going to get anything out of it. I want to lift after the game. People say, well, you know, they might be tired after a game. Yeah, but I need, I need I have my program, I didn't want it to be anything but whatever they can handle for max effort at that time. That way they didn't have to worry about it. They can recover. Because to me, you know, being a former player, if I was going to lift before a game and I knew somebody out there was going to be throwing hard, I'm going to probably take a little bit off the bench press and the squat and whatever. And just, I don't know, today we got this guy throwing. And that's, you know, you're in the big leagues. That, that guy's throwing every day. You're never going to get away from him, right? Um, and I think the other part, too, is, you know, like I said, the volume. It's anti-volume. But there's also anti a lot of other things, too. Anti-rotation. I wouldn't be doing a whole lot of medicine ball twists and all that stuff during the season. I'd be doing anti-rotation, anti-flexion, anti-extension, something that would get you away from all that. stuff. That's exactly like throwing a ball. You know, every time you throw a ball, that humerus wants to come out of that socket every time. What you need is anti that, right? And so you need to do something other than that to keep that in there. That's how arm gets healthy, not just, oh, we just need to do more of that because the arm does this. We just got to keep doing that. No, not at all. Uh, so I think those are the three things. Make sure your in-season program is very high intensity, um, low volume. Of course, cycle that. I like to go three up, one down. Three successive, maybe a 70, 80, 90% down to 60. Um, include a short sprint program and make sure it comes from many positions because not every time do you run straight ahead, uh, especially fielders, everybody in the infield is all going one direction. They're all going to first. You got to keep that in mind. Understand the position. Um, uh, and I think that's just the two things in season that you'd want to do and, and you know, certainly, you know, understand the game, because that's going to really, it's going to expand how well your program is going to be perceived and the results you're going to get from it. That's great. Well, I, I want to thank you for taking the time coach. Yeah. And, uh, I always like to go straight to the source for these types of things. <laughs> like I, you know, I, I have my opinion sometimes based on what I see, but I just don't have the wealth of experience that you have. So thanks for doing this. Yeah, you're welcome. I think, I think science is, you know, well, we went from having probably, you know, 20 full-time head strength coaches and nobody in the minor league. So now we got a strength coach at every uh, major league park and assistant got a minor league coordinator for every organization a strength coach at every spot. And now we're starting to put in some sports science in there. I just hope that, 
they know what to do with it, you know, and they know how to use it. And it gets, I think maybe right now, grabbing onto technology is a little bit farther ahead than the implementation and the intervention. I think they're just, it's all shiny and they want to go get it. But so they made, you know, they made some great strides there. I think there's really some really good young coaches in there. But again, you know, the game is really old. It's run by older guys, <laughs> you know, so you, there's a lot of guys out there that are, that you and I would really look at and think, wow, this guy's really good. And, and, and is just unable to bring everything to the table. So, uh, you know, like I said, sometimes it's hard to figure out what, what's happening there, but there's no, there's no question there's something happening there, you know? So what do we do with that? Right. Well, I think it comes back to that administration management piece that you're talking about is like, you can drop in the pieces. Like you got a strength coach, you got a sports scientist, but unless you're actively involved in making that work and having, making sure the parts work together, it's, it's not, necessarily going to work no not at all not at all now and I will say this you know in, you know as we part ways here both times with the A's both times I don't remember one person you know again remember now so my first manager was Tony La Russa and his group you know Hall of Fame Billy Bean Sandy Alderson Dave Forrest Zadie, Paul D. Podesta not one time in the 13 years I was with that club did anybody ever ask a question or question me they just felt like this is what we do they never stopped me, asked me, told me to stop anything at any time ever. That, to me, made me not want to fail them, you know. A cop the fact they were trying to help me get better and, and be, you know, this is what we do here, you know. And um, so, you know, you're right. I did have a great job. I had the greatest job in baseball twice. And so that, you know, I mean, it could have been, you know, the good news was nothing, nothing but good stuff came out of it. On the other hand, look, at some point you say, you know, we got to let the guy do what he's supposed to do. You know, especially if we don't know what he's doing. I mean, we hired him. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. This is the way it goes. In my case, it worked out. But, you know, these guys nickel and diamond you saying, okay, you can do whatever you want to do, except for this, 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 and this. You know, and all of a sudden the guy gets hurt. Even that conversation is a bitch, right? You can't go in there and say, well, I didn't want to do that. I'd rather do this, but you wouldn't let me. Yeah, I know. Too bad. Sorry. <laughs> You're, uh, we're going to go in another direction. The old another direction thing. <laughs> well, on that note, thanks again, Coach. And uh, I'll be posting this, and I'm sure we'll get some uh, interesting reaction from uh, from everybody. So, cool. uh, thanks again, and ha enjoy your day. And I'll uh, I'll touch base with you very soon. Okay. Thanks, Derek. Take thanks, care. Bob. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye. Bye.